Good afternoon, everyone. On the first week of our discussion, we already tackled the organizational structure and some concepts in organizational leadership. Now, let's have a deeper view regarding the two fundamental components of organizational leadership. The two fundamental components of organizational leadership are the organization and the leader. Organization is a group of people organized for some end or work meaning those who are part of the organizations have a common goals. So for example, we have the organizations in a company that has a main goal is to maximize profits. We have the military, which goal is to preserve peace and security as well as to provide for the defense of the country. There's the political party, which uh, aims to promote specific ideological or policy goals. For the school department, their goal is to improve society through high-quality specialized education. And for the team, their goal is to improve the players' skills to win the game. And in the organization, the person responsible for directing or guiding that group is called the leader. For the company, we have the CEO. For the military, we have the army general. For political party, there's a political leader. In school, they have a school superintendent. For the department, there is a department head. And in the team, they have a team coach. These are a few examples representing the two fundamental components of organizational leadership. Thus, by means of these two fundamentals, we define organizational leadership as a dual focus management approach that works towards what is best for individuals and what is best for a group simultaneously. The Society for Human Resources Management, or SHRM, defines leadership as the process by which an individual determines direction, influences a group, and directs the group toward a specific goal or mission. So organization, meron tayong tinatawag na upper management or top management, meron ding middle and the lower level management. Usually, ang top level uh, management is composed of the president, CEO, general manager, and board of directors. In the middle management naman, nadyan yung mga department heads, branch manager, and the vice president. And in the lower level management, dyan natin makikita yung mga supervisors, team leader, and foreman. The question is, uh, how about those in the middle and in the lower level management? Can they be considered also leaders like those in the top level management? The answer in this question is yes. A manager, a president, a principal, and other heads might be at the top of the organization, but leaders are found all across, up and down that same chart. So, and many people assume that leadership is all about titles, that, is, that it is all about position, money, and fame. However, leadership is not an actual position or title. In fact, it is about the action you take and the example you set for others. It is the ability to influence others. It's about the impact you have on others. So, what are some of the characteristics of a good leader of the organization? First is, leaders are effective communicators. They should be able to clearly and concisely explain problems and solutions. They should know when to talk and when to listen. And in addition, leaders are able to communicate on different levels. Mapa one-on-one -on -one man yan, via phone, email, or other modes of communication. Also, leaders are long-term thinkers. They always look at the big picture, meaning they have a vision of where they and their team will be in the future, and they have a long-term plan for their organization. They are also confident. Confidence doesn't mean arrogance. A truly confident person is simply aware of their abilities. They know what they are good at and is unafraid of responsibility and pressure. They are also people-oriented. 
a true leader must be able to inspire and motivate others. They are able to foster a team culture, involve others in decision making, and show concern for each team member. Leaders are also self-motivated and are able to keep going and attain goals despite setbacks. They are also emotionally stable. They exercise good control and regulation over their own behavior and are able to tolerate frustration and stress. They are able to cope with changes in environment without having an intense emotional reaction. Next, we have the organizational leadership theories. First is the trait theory. It is concerned on what type of person makes a good leader. This is based on the assumption that people are born with inherited traits and some traits are particularly suited to leadership. Based in this theory, great leaders have common personality characteristics, and if you possess several, if not all, qualities or traits, you will also be considered leader. On the other hand, the contingency theory of leadership is concerned on how does the situation influence good leadership. According to this theory, an individual can be effective leader in one circumstance and ineffective leader in another one. It suggests that a leader's effectiveness will be contingent upon how well their style of leadership fits the post they hold. For instance, when you need to make quick decisions, which style is best? When you need the full support of your team, is there a more effective way to lead? Should the leader be more people-oriented or task-oriented? These are all questions that contingency leadership theories try to address. Next is power and influence theories. These theories tell what is the source of the leader's power. It focuses on how leaders can motivate their team by using their power and influence. The power is the ability to influence, and influence is the ability to bring about the change. The main study supporting this theory in action was conducted by John French and Bertram Raven in 1959. They identified five forms of power, the coercive power, the reward power, the referent power, the legitimate power, and the expert power. Let's discuss first the coercive power. This power is the use of force to get an employee to follow an instruction or order. This power is in use, for example, when an employee carries out an order under fear, like fear of losing their job or not getting their annual bonus. Next is the reward power. It is much the same as the coercive power except the leader motivates their team by offering rewards based on the tasks they assign. For example, the supervisor who provides employees additional bonus or incentive when they meet an objective she sets for a project. On the other hand, legitimate power is the power derived from the position you hold in an organization. With legitimate power, it is your position that gives you your power. For example, is the CEO has, who has the power to execute his function in determining the overall direction of the company and also its resources. For the referent power naman, it comes from being trusted and respected. We can gain referent power when others trust what we do and respect us for how we handle situations. For example, the Human Resource Associate who is known for ensuring employees are treated fairly and coming to the rescue of those who are not. Next is the Expert Power. It comes from one's experiences, skills, or knowledge. As we gain experience in particular areas and become thought leaders in those areas, we begin to gather expert power that can be utilized to get others to help us meet our goals. For example, is the project manager who is an expert at solving particularly challenging problems to ensure a project stays on track. So the last organizational theory is the behavioral theory of leadership. It focuses on what does a good leader do.
It also focuses on how leaders behave and assumes that these traits can be copied by other leaders. It suggests that leaders aren't born successful but can be created based on learnable behavior. To learn more about behavioral theory, theorists studied some types of leadership styles. First, let's discuss the autocratic leadership. Autocratic leaders make decisions on behalf of their teams. So, in this style, sinusunod lang ng mga empleyado yung utos or order ng leader. Ang leader magsasabi or magdadirect ng gagawin nila at mag instruct kung paano ito gagawin. Ang magiging benefit lang nito is a quicker decision making and a clear chain of command. Pero para sa mga creative employees o yung mga empleyado na gustong maging part ng decision making at gustong magbigay ng kanilang insights on how to improve their task, maaring di sila mag-enjoy sa ganitong setup. They may feel unmotivated and uninspired. In contrast naman, yung democratic leadership. So, yung democratic leadership ay tinatawag ding uh, participative leadership because leaders involve everyone's voice. So, based sa researches, maaring hindi mas productive ang mga empleyado sa style na ito compared dun sa autocratic leadership, but masasabi na mas mataas ang quality na naproproduce nila. Ang drawback lang dito is may mga pagkakataon na hindi nagiging malinaw yung role ng bawat isa sa isang grupo. So, dito nagkakaroon ng miscommunication. Para naman sa delegative or the license fair leadership, leaders uh, under this style are very hands-off. Wala masyadong uh, supervision or guidance from the leader. So, lumalabas na ang power is handed over the group or the team. Based sa mga researches, maaring mas maging less productive ang mga empleyado under this style since wala masyadong monitoring at maaring magkanya-kanya ang mga tao sa trabaho at di makipag-cooperate sa paggawa ng task nila. Sinasabing mas uh, appropriate ang ganitong klaseng leadership style sa mga high-skilled workers and creative teams. And on the other hand naman, maaring hindi maging fit ito sa mga group na kinakailangan pang i-enhance ang knowledge sa uh, kanilang trabaho. So, there are many other leadership styles in the organization. To lead effectively, you'll need to find a style of leadership compatible with your uh, both personality and your organization. And I will end the presentation reiterating the saying of John Maxwell that a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way.